Man. All right. Hey, you guys can be seated. Um, uh, we have a baptism next service, and Jeremy's going to get baptized next service. So, yeah, it's awesome. And um, But so since we don't have anyone this time, unless someone wants to get baptized, just raise your hand. Um, he's going to share just a quick testimony of what God has, has been doing in his life, and um, you can use that microphone right there, yeah. All right, hello, guys. Hey, hi. So I was baptized when I was younger, um, around... Um, but when I was around the age of 12, I was exposed to pornography for the first time in my life. And that started a 10-year addiction that had a hold on my life. And um, I really, when I got a little older, I really started questioning things in religion. And I started to do a deep dive study on religion and all the religions. And I found out that Christianity could not be true. Um, but even after that, I was still was struggling with the sin. And it, uh, it was November 6th of 2021, and I was uh, reading through Genesis, and um, it got to the point where uh, Eve, or the serpent was talking to Eve, and the line was, did God really say? And that, is, that was the lie that I had been telling myself for 10 years. And, um, sorry. <laughs> um, and uh, so at, at that day, I decided I needed to changed my life around and I uh, started researching what to do and all through kind of programs to help get out of it and all of them were saying that the first thing you need to do was to repent and I kind of realized that day that I had never truly repented in my life and that day I repented of my sins and officially made Jesus my Lord and Savior that day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. yeah, thank you for sharing. Isn't that a good testimony? So... <laughs> so, yeah, um, let's just, hey, let's pray for Jeremy right now, and just let's ask that the Lord will just watch over him and, and protect him, and um, because, you know, the enemy wants to come even after people get baptized, and, but we're, we're so grateful for you, and we're glad that you're getting baptized, and you're making that decision, and we're just, we all support you, and we're proud of you, so. Lord, we just thank you. For Jeremy, Lord, and just the baptism that he's going to do and just how he's really committed his life to you, Lord, and, and how you've broken chains in his life and his heart, Lord. And we're just so grateful, Lord, that he's just deciding to, to pro publicly proclaim, Lord, uh, following you. And, and we just pray for him, Lord. We put, ask you to put a hedge of protection around him. We ask you to fill him with your Holy Spirit and um, just be doing a mighty work in his life, Lord, as, as you're already doing. And um, we just give you thanks for, for him today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Meet and greet? Is yeah. that what we're doing now? Sure, let's do that. <laughs> Is that what we're doing now? Yeah. Yeah, why don't you turn to one another and say hi. I don't know. That was... All right. <laughs> Well, we wanted to say happy Easter to everybody, happy Resurrection Sunday. What a, what a blessed time. Hey, I wanted to mention um, one quick announcement, is this Wednesday, uh, we are going to be showing a movie at 7 p.m., and it's called Before the Wrath. Some of you have seen it, but it's just one of those movies you can see over and over again. Jan Markell, Jack Hibbs, Amir Sarfati, J.D. Farag. Uh, it's a documentary, and it'll start right at 7 p.m., and so we just encourage you to come out this Wednesday. And then the next Wednesday, my friend Mike Evers from Island Christian Fellowship on Camino Island is going to be sharing, and you, you're not going to want to miss that. So make sure you mark your calendars the next two Wednesdays. Um, but let's open our Bibles to Mark chapter 16. And, you know, we've been studying the book of Mark, and... Um, where we ended, we're kind of at the end of chapter 12 um, last week, and so today we're just going to jump ahead to chapter 16, and then uh, in a few weeks we're going to jump back to chapter 13 and, and then finish it. So anyways, and then also I wanted to mention that we have a group that's going to Israel tomorrow. <laughs> so um, why don't, everybody who's going to Israel, why don't you stand, let's just say a quick prayer for you, because there's a lot of crazy stuff going on, but you know. We're good to go. Oh, 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 yeah. You want to go? We can hide you in the suitcase. No. 
All right, Lord, we just thank you for the Israel team. We ask, Lord, that you would keep us safe, that you'd watch over us, Lord. And um, just bless our time as we're in the Holy Land. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. If you could just keep us in prayer. Tomorrow we have, there's, we have two groups on two different flights. And so um, one group is going to San Francisco. <laughs> and then Tel Aviv. And then the other group is going to Paris and then Tel Aviv. So, but, um, but you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a, an amazing time. So anyways, keep us in your prayer. Actually, you know, that reminds me of a story I heard about a man who went to Jerusalem on vacation with his wife, and he brought his ever-nagging, very difficult to deal with mother-in-law. And sadly, while they were there on his trip, his mother-in-law suddenly passed away. Now, I just want to say she lived a very long life, and they were trying to figure out what to do with the body. And so the undertaker said to them, well, you know what? Um, you can have the body shipped home to the United States, uh, though it is very expensive. It's about $5,000. Um, you might, there's another option. You might want to consider burying her right here in Israel. And we could do that. It only, it's only $150. And the man thought about it for a few moments, and he said, well, okay, well, you know, I'm going to go ahead and have her shipped back to America. And, and the undertaker said, well, sir, I don't know if you heard what I said. You could bury her here right in the Holy Land for for $150, and, and, and why would you want to spend $5,000 to ship her back? And the man replied, well, you know what? A long time ago, a man was buried here. Three days later, he rose from the dead. <laughs> and I just cannot take that chance. <laughs> you know, you just can't ignore the resurrection of Jesus. It changed human history, right? And it changed most of our lives as well, the resurrection. And because Jesus died and he rose, uh, rose again, we have hope. <laughs> and that's really what Easter is all about, hope. You know, our hope is in God. You know, our, our, our hope is not in technology. Aren't you thankful for that? Because technology is always changing. Our hope is not in, in human solutions, our hope is not in politicians. I hope it's not in that because they will disappoint us. You know, but also our hope is not in, in preachers because guess what? We will disappoint too. Our hope is in Jesus and that's what Easter is all about. Hope, the resurrection. And Jesus, again, he was put on trial. He was condemned to death. He was, he was uh, even though he was an innocent man, he was beaten, he was crucified, he, he was died he died, he was buried, and, and these are all elements of the gospel. You know, the gospel is what a person needs to believe in in order to be saved. It's what a person needs to believe in to need to be forgiven. It's what a person needs to believe in to know God. God wants us to know him. It's what 1 Corinthians says. It says, moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel uh, which I preach to you, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, he was buried, and he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. And this is what I want us to consider as we look at the resurrection this morning. If you're in Mark chapter 16, look at verse 1. It says, now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices that they might come and anoint him. So Jesus, he died on Friday afternoon. Friday afternoon, he was buried before sunset on Friday. And when the Sabbath would begin, on, the Sabbath would begin on Friday evening at sunset, and it would go until Saturday evening at sunset. And, and, and so um, they, they would, these ladies, they went to the market, they would buy these spices and these aroma oils, and they would put on the body of Jesus. They're, they're, they were coming to do that Sunday morning. And, the, you know, the Jews, they didn't practice embalming. You know, this was just, they would put spices over the, the dead bodies. It would, it, would, it would help with the odor and the decay. And it was a symbolic gesture of your loving devotion, right? Uh, the verse, uh, chap, verse 2, chapter 16. Very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen 
And they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up and they saw the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. You know, in Israel, it's very common for graves to have a a, a very heavy, flat, a uh, round stone that, that they would have this groove in, in, in the, mou- the mouth of the, of the tomb. And, uh, you know, for a small grave, it would take up to maybe even 20 men to, to require to roll away the stone. It, you know, they didn't want people going in there, and it would cover the, 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 the tomb. And Matthew's gospel actually tells us that how the stone was rolled away, it, it says the angel of the Lord did it. And keep in mind, this, this wasn't rolled away so Jesus could get out of the tomb. I mean, Jesus, he, he was in this resurrected body. He, could, he had the ability to walk through walls. But it was, the stone was moved so the disciples, and, and it, they could see that he had risen. That's why it was rolled away. Verse 6 says, but then he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. So I always have a question here. Were they alarmed that the the body of Jesus was missing, or were they alarmed that there's an angel talking to them? Maybe both. (laughs) Verse 7, but go tell the disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee, There you will see him. And as he said to you, so they went out quickly, fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now, when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of of whom he had cast out the seven, seven demons. And she went out and told those who had been with him, and they mourned and wept. And when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. Now, according to really the original language here, that, that because they, 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 they deep, had a deep love for Jesus, after three days, many of them were rugged fishermen. It tells us that they were weeping <laughs> convulsively, really, is the, in the language. They were sobbing that Jesus had died. And when Mary Magdalene reported that he was alive, what did they do? They went right back to weeping (laughs) and hurting. Why? Because of unbelief. It tells us right there. They did not believe them. Verse 11, they did not believe. They did not believe. The disciples had... If disciples had believed right here, I think their, their, their weeping what it would have turned to what? Joy. They, they, they would have had joy if they would have believed at this moment. But they chose not to believe and remained in their sorrow longer than necessary. They chose not to believe. Look at verse 12. And a- after that, he appeared in another form form to two of them as they walked and went into the country, and they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. They didn't believe them. Verse 14, later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and the hardness of their heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. It's kind of interesting to me that the first thing that Jesus does is he rebuked them. (laughs) Isn't that interesting? He rebuked his disciples. I can't believe you guys. Here I am. You know, I I rose, I told you guys I was going to rise from the dead, and, 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 and he rebukes them. I think there's something to pay attention here with, you know, because why, why did he rebuke them? Because it says their unbelief and the hardness of their hearts. That's why they were rebuked. 
their unbelief and the hardness of their hearts. And because of these two areas, I think it's, it, these are areas as Christians we struggle with. You know, hard hearts. Well, how does someone's heart grow hard? Well, you know, hard hearts can grow in relationships. They can grow, you know, in close relationships. We can get hard hearts. In marriages, there can be hard hearts. And, and, and hard hearts are uh, towards the church. People can get hard hearts. Something happened, and they, they, they were disappointed, and so they don't want to go to church anymore. You know, people can get hard hearts towards serving. They don't want to serve anymore. I, it's too much. I don't, I don't want to do this. I'm just going through the motions. People can get hard hearts because they're disappointed in God. He didn't answer their, their prayers. He didn't do what they would hope or hoping he was going to do. That's what was happening here, right? Things didn't turn out the way they wanted them to. Unbelief and hard hearts. You know, the Israelites, when they wandered around in the wilderness, they had hard hearts, it says, because they had run out of water and they were having difficult times. And Psalm 95 8 tells us that they developed hard hearts. They complained against God. And the disciples here, they, they've just gone through the biggest disappointment ever. They had been trusting in Jesus and he had let them down. They thought. And he died, and it seemed that if he wanted to die, he didn't resist them. And you know what? They had hard hearts. They had unbelief. Do you know God, he, he wants all of us, listen to this, he wants all of us to have soft hearts, not hard hearts. He wants us to have soft hearts. And you know, when, when you have a soft heart when you're born again. When you're born again, he gives you a soft heart. You know, and, and he gives, you know, to be born again, think about what that means. He gives you a fresh start. Born again, it's new. Our hearts get this fresh start and we begin to develop faith. I mean, unbelief is, is the opposite of faith. See, the Lord, he, he wants us to have faith. The disciples, they're, they aren't being really healthy skeptics here. That, I mean, their first idea that Jesus had been risen from the dead should have been when the women first reported at the tomb. And it was empty. And the, the, the angel said, he, hey, he is risen. And then their second idea should have been when Peter and John, they confirmed the tomb was empty. And the third should have been when Mary came back and, uh, you know, a second time she said she had actually seen Jesus. And then the fourth, the witnesses, the two fellows on the road to Emmaus, they were reporting, hey, we were walking, we were talking with Jesus. And so the question is, you know, why didn't they believe? Why, did, why didn't they have faith? Why, was there's, uh, why did they have hard hearts? Why did they have unbelief? You know, sometimes when I think about faith, you know, faith, it, I, I think sometimes we have this notion that, that, that faith is just some kind of magical fairy dust we have in our pocket and we take it out. Oh, I've got to have faith, you know, um, that Christians we're supposed to carry around with us. You know, I think if we, could, if we only had enough of, of this magic, <laughs> you know, all of our problems would go away. You know, it, but that, that's not what faith is. The Bible teaches that faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. You know, it's counting on something you don't see. You know, it's trusting in something that doesn't always make sense. Faith is, it, it, it doesn't make all your problems go away. You know, it, 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 faith helps you get through your problems. God likes it when we have faith. Do you know that? In Hebrews eleven six 6, it says, Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he, comes, he who comes to God must believe that he is, that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Faith produces something inside our hearts, doesn't it? It produces works, and, and, and that's what keep, helps Christians keep going, because we have faith and we trust in what the Lord is doing. The disciples, they were going to have plenty of difficult times ahead in their lives. They were going to face unbelievable persecution. And, and, and they, they were just going to 
go through things that would want them want to quit, right? They would just want to quit. They would just need to keep on going, and they would need to keep on telling people about Jesus, and that would require faith. They had to have faith. They had to trust in Jesus despite their circumstances. Hebrews 11 also gives us all sorts of examples of people who had faith, who trusted in God. One of my favorite ones was Noah. Here's what it says about Noah in Hebrews 11. It says, by faith, Noah, being divinely warned of the things yet not seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. See, Noah's faith didn't make the flood disappear. Noah's faith helped him build a really big boat. (laughs) You know, this boat that rescued him and his entire family. But he built a boat without ever seeing rain. His entire life, (laughs) he had never seen rain. But he trusted God. He trusted in what God told him. He trusted in what God said. And God was very pleased, even though he didn't understand everything. Even though the disciples, you know, in their circumstances, they would want to quit. They had to have faith. Guys, faith is part of salvation. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. A purse for a person to know God, to find forgiveness of their sins, to be assured of that that, that eternal, heavenly salvation. We have to trust in Jesus. It comes down to that. We have to trust in Jesus. We have to trust that he died for our sins. We have to trust that that his death was enough to, to, to take us and make the way to heaven. Well, how do we build our faith? Well, guess what? It's through the word. You know, that Jesus, he, he, when he was with the, the disciples on that road to Emmaus, he started teaching them the scriptures. Wouldn't that have been a great Bible study? <laughs> he was teaching them scriptures, and, and, you know, Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. If you want your faith to increase, you need to, Hear and listen and read the word. And what happens is you put the Bible in your heart. And you'll realize God is someone you can count on through obedience. You know, every time we take steps of faith, every time we do something that stretches us a little, I believe faith stretches us. You know, because when we step out in faith, it's scary. If you've ever stepped out, you, you will know that when you're uncomfortable, your faith grows. <laughs> and you see God work. Sometimes we have to step out in, in talking to our friends about Jesus. You know, <clears throat> in, in the scriptures here, verse 15, if you're still in Mark 16, it says, And, Jesus, and he said to them, after he rebuked them, <laughs> He said to them, go into the, all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So after he rebukes them, he's like, you guys should have, you guys should have believed. He says, well, listen, I, I want you to go now into the world. And I want, you to, I want you to preach the gospel, the good news. And this is what we call the Great Commission. You know, the Great Commission, it started with the disciples here, and it was Jesus, you know, parting these instructions to them to, to go and preach to the whole world. Go preach this message. And it wasn't just about preaching the gospel. It wasn't ab- uh, about driving around in a truck with a loudspeaker and, and sharing Bible verses to people. It wasn't that. It was about making disciples, you know, making disciples. I mean, a disciple is a learner. A disciple is a follower. And the 12 were disciples, but they weren't the last disciples. They were the first disciples. Now, 
we get to carry the same message. Jesus, you know, he was a friend to sinners. And God wants us to have that same kind of heart that he does to reach this lost world for him. You know, I think that when it comes to evangelism, when it comes to sharing the gospel, it doesn't always have to be about talking to strangers or debating issues. You know, oftentimes I think it happens right as we just simply start praying for those people that we have relationship with that don't know Jesus. And as we pray for them, God gives us opportunities to share. You know, also as for all of us Christians here, you know, God wants us to grow as Christians. He wants us to, to learn to follow him. He wants us to be disciples of him. And I just ask you where you're at today. Where are, where are you at on this Easter? You know, what, what, what do you need in your life? Do you need more faith or do you need more hope? That's what Easter is about. It's about faith and hope. <laughs> You know, are you in that place where you just need to take a, a first step in, in trusting God? Are, are, are you ready to open your heart to Jesus? Are you ready to take next steps in your walk to go, as it tells us? I, I guess I just want us to end today with just thinking about what does Easter mean to us? You know, Easter is a day when, when we, of course, we celebrate the resurrection. It is a perfect day to, to have a baptism because baptism represents that you know, where you, you go under and it's like your, your body's dead, but then you come up and you have this new life. We celebrate Jesus rising from the dead today. And that's, that's why we're here. You know, guys, this is generally a happy day for us, isn't it? It's like one of the happiest days. But it wasn't happy notice for the disciples, was it? They, they were sad. They were weeping. They were sobbing. That was the first Easter. <laughs> it wasn't a day of faith. It wasn't a day of joy for them. It was a day of doom and gloom. <laughs> In their minds, Jesus had failed them. Jesus had let them down. You know, in their minds, Jesus had not kept his promise. And they had given up hope. They had given up hope. And maybe you've come here today. You're, you're here at church this morning, and you're in a similar state. You feel as though God has let you down. But know this. Sometimes our disappointments are his appointment. Sometimes he, he wants us to, he, he, he needs us to kind of realize where we're at because he wants to work in your life. He wants to work in your heart, just like we just read today in the disciples. They had this unbelief, they had a hard heart, and he, he, he rebuked them. He said, hey, have joy. I rose, I rose from the grave, you guys. This is the good news. Now go share this with everyone. Maybe today. He just wants you to yield your life to him. Could I just have everybody stand up? I'm going to pray for us. Just Let's just bow our heads and close our eyes. And I, I just think that maybe some of us, we need faith. We need more faith in our life. And I would just, if that's you, just, I would just pray it. Just ask the Lord for more faith. And maybe some of you, you need more hope. Maybe love. I mean, that's the three things, faith, hope, and love. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus. And you want, a, you want a soft heart. You want to be born again. You want to be in eternity with the Lord. Maybe you just want to rededicate your life to him maybe you've you know sometimes people can come to church a good part of their life and they've never really submitted they've never really surrendered and this isn't to embarrass anyone or anything but if 
and if you want to give your life to Jesus, I, mean, I invite you to come down the first row here and sit down. We'll have some people come pray with you. Or if you want to rededicate your life to Jesus, man, we want to pray with you this morning. You know, Easter is a day of hope. Easter is a day of, of uh, being reborn. <laughs> it's a day of a resurrection, and that's what the Lord, he wants to do in our lives. He wants to resurrect us. And so, if there is anybody, we just invite you to come down now. And we'll pray with you. And if there's not, that's okay. We can pray with you afterwards, too. But let's just consider these things as we sing this last song. And in the Spirit we are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We pray that our unity may one day be restored And they'll know we are Christian by our love By our love, yes, they'll know we are Christian by our love We will walk with each other, we will walk Hand in hand.